Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marianne Smith, and I am a registered dietitian and PhD candidate at the University of Guelph. It is a pleasure to speak to you today on what we know about food security in Canada and its potential links to chronic disease. I'd like to start with the basics. So what is food security? The Food and Agricultural Organization defines it as when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. Now this may seem like one simple sentence, but it's actually jam-packed with information. A couple of things I want to point out. First, at all times. This is important because food insecurity can be sporadic or periodic in nature. It's not necessarily a constant state of being food secure or being food insecure. As well, we often think about people either having enough money to buy food or not enough money to buy food. But it's also important to consider individuals' physical access to food as well. Do they have a grocery store in their area or some other place where they can purchase food? Within that grocery store, do they have access to the foods that are healthful and will contribute to a long and happy life? Uh, finally, can they get to the grocery store? So all of these physio physical barriers need to be taken to into account as well. Finally, it's important to consider not only that the, in the food individuals are choosing will contribute to their physiological needs, but also to their food preferences. Are the foods that they have access to um, socially and culturally and emotionally fulfilling as well as physiologically filling? The definition of food security put forth by the Food and Agricultural Organization is generally recognized as being from the individual perspective of food security. But there are two other perspectives of food security as well. The first is community food security. And community food security really focuses on community self-reliance in that uh, food is grown, sold, and consumed all at the local level and everyone in the community has equal access to food and that the growing practices and purchasing practices are really sustainable. The third perspective in food security is the national food security perspective and these can um, this includes broader concerns that governments would deal with in terms of regulating trade policies, um, rural development, practices for growing at a national level, um, as well as emergency preparedness in that if we have a natural disaster and our food supply is cut off, uh, we have a backup plan for feeding the citizens. So what's our situation like in Canada? The latest round of the Canadian Community Health Survey in 2007-2008 found that 7.7% of households were food insecure. That's about 956,000 households in Canada. Uh, the definition of food insecurity can be broken down into moderately food insecure and severely food insecure. Moderate food insecurity is associated with compromised food quality and or quantity, whereas severe food insecurity is associated with a decreased intake and disrupted eating patterns, such as skipping meals. You can see from the chart that there's quite a bit of geographic variation across Canada, the lowest rates being in Saskatchewan at 6.4% and the highest in Nunavut at 31.9%. 7.7% of households being food insecure in Canada is concerning, but it's important to recognize that key subgroups of the population might experience even higher rates. So here are some of the vulnerable subpopulations in Canada. The first is Aboriginal households. 20.9% 20 of house, Aboriginal households living off reserve were found to be food insecure by the Canadian Community Health Survey. 
Um, this number actually is drastically increased if you look at Aboriginal households that are located on a reserve. Uh, between 40 and 83 percent has been found in different studies. Children are also a vulnerable subpopulation. Census data suggests that 12.5% of Canadian children are food insecure, representing 37% of the population that uses food banks. The Canadian Community Health Survey um, data reinforces the census data um, by showing that households with either children under six years of age or more than two children at home um, be, had a higher risk of being food insecure than households without young children or without more than two children at home. Low-income households are another vulnerable subpopulation. So if you take all of the household incomes in Canada and rank order them and then divide them into 10 groups, the highest income group will have less than 1% food insecurity prevalence, whereas the lowest income group will have 32.5% food insecurity household preva prevalence. So there is quite a large variation, and this is a clear inverse relationship between income and food insecurity. Recent immigrant households are the fourth vulnerable subpopulation in Canada, with 12.6% of these households being food insecure. Recent is defined as having lived in Canada fewer than five years, and the good news is that after five years, prevalence of food insecurity in immigrant households becomes comparable to food insecurity in non-immigrant households. Because women comprise a large proportion of low-income and lone parent households, uh, we recognize that they may be a particularly vulnerable subgroup of the Canadian population, although we don't have population-level data to support this. We do, however, have regional studies um, that have shown that, uh, one particular from Atlantic Canada showed that um, lone parent households run by women had food insecurity rates as high as 96.5%. So here's a list of other factors um, that affect food security status, and I will not go into these in detail, but you can see that there's quite a variety of them. Two more factors that have a strong impact on food security I do want to discuss in more detail, and those are geography and income. So geography and food security, um, the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada in 2009 did a really interesting study where they created a shopping list and then sent out shoppers in 66 communities across Canada to purchase those items. They found very interesting differences in both the availability of the products and the prices of the products across Canada. With respect to the availability of products, they found that some places had much um, more difficulty purchasing the items on the list than others. For example, in Bearskin Lake Reserve, only 33% of the items on the study's shopping list were available for purchase. As well, specific items had uh, m more of a chance of not being purchased across Canada than others. For example, frozen spinach and dried beans were only available in one in three grocery stores, and unbreaded fish was only available in one in five grocery stores in Canada. Looking at how the price varies between regions, we see that the differences were vast. For example, six apples cost an average of $3.50. However, in some places, those same six apples were available for as little as 90 cents, and in others, they cost $7.64. Interestingly, and kind of in contrast to the high-nutrient foods I've shown here, prices for high-energy but low-nutrient foods, like chips and cookies, were relatively stable across Canada.
The next factor is income. So fixed costs like rent and transportation are often standard across income groups, but what changes is the amount of money available for discretionary spending. As household income decreases, households have disproportionately less money to spend on variable costs like food, making food a highly elastic component of a household budget. If an individual or a household has less money to spend on food, their food choices may become restricted, and it's important to recognize that cheaper foods are usually higher in energy and lower in nutrients. An interesting study on inflation between 1985 and 2000 shows this perfectly. Fresh fruits and vegetables um, increased in price by 118% in those 15 years, whereas the price of uh, high-energy, low-nutrient foods like soft drinks and sugars and sweets only increased 20 and 46% comparatively. So in 2000, the relative price of soft drinks and sugar and sweets is much cheaper than for fruits and vegetables. So you can see quite quickly how having a limited income can negatively impact food choice. This is a transition slide that kind of shows how food security can be related to chronic disease using the variables that we've talked about. So all the factors that contribute to an individual's food security status uh, can impact the individual's food choices, both quantity and quality. And overall, we could say that those factors affect the individual's overall diet. And we do know that diet is linked to chronic disease. So therefore, it's not that much of a stretch to suppose that food security status is directly linked to chronic disease status. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the specific links between food security and chronic disease. The first is during gestation and childhood. Um, for obvious ethical reasons, we don't have good information from well-controlled experimental studies that examine the links between food security and um, gestational and childhood illnesses. Um, but we do have good information from natural observational studies that were conducted during periods of food shortages. During pregnancy, severe food insecurity was associated with children who were predisposed to a whole host of different illnesses and um, metabolic irregularities, including impaired glucose tolerance, obesity, heart disease, dyslipidemia, schizophrenia, and affective disorders. And they think that these um, disorders are a result of physiological and endocrine changes that occurred during fetal development. During childhood, we know that children from severely food insecure households have a higher prevalence of iron deficiency anemia and lower serum zinc levels than children from food secure households. And iron and zinc are dietary indicators that are associated with negative growth and developmental delays. There's also a direct graded relationship between the severity of food insecurity experienced by the child and frequency of behavioral problems and hospital visits. The literature also acknowledges a positive relationship between food insecurity and type 2 diabetes that is independent of weight. However, at this point in time, it's kind of a chicken and egg syndrome in that we don't know if food insecurity causes type 2 diabetes or if it's just associated with it. We already know that a high proportion of individuals who are food insecure also have low income. Because of the increased costs of medications and healthy foods that contribute to glycemic control, people with low income and diabetes can find themselves in the very unfortunate position of choosing either a healthy diet or medication or some sort of in-between rationing system. And as a result, these individuals are almost twice as likely to have poor glycemic control and frequent severe bouts of hypo hypoglycemia than individuals with diabetes but without financial barriers. So we don't know that food insecurity causes type 2 diabetes, but we do know that food insecurity makes it more difficult for individuals to manage their disease.
The relationship between obesity and food insecurity in the literature has been confusing and conflicting for many years. However, we are beginning to think that this relationship is moderated by the severity of food insecurity. So, people who experience mild food insecurity, that is, without hunger, that's associated with an increased incidence of obesity. However, individuals who experience severe food insecurity, that is, with hunger, show no um, association between uh, food insecurity and obesity. And this kind of makes sense. If someone is food insecure, but they are still able to feed themselves um, with maybe cheaper, more higher energy foods, um, it's not a stretch to uh, believe that they could gain weight. However, if someone is experiencing food, severe food insecurity with hunger, um, that's associated with a total decreased caloric intake and uh, we would not be expecting them to gain weight. I also want to point out that this linkage is stronger in women. The relationship between heart disease and food insecurity is also not clear as of yet. On one hand, a study showed that food insecurity was associated with a higher prevalence of heart disease, hypertension, and self-reported hyperlipidemia. Another study that looked at individuals who had financial barriers to buying food, however, showed that they did not have significantly increased prevalences of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, total cholesterol, or hemoglobin levels. So stay tuned for more information on this link for sure as um, more research will uncover the intricacies of this relationship. Preliminary studies suggest that in populations that already have kidney disease, individuals with low income are more likely to have higher serum phosphate levels than those who are not high income. And the authors hypothesized that the reason for the increased phosphate levels was an increased intake of cheap processed foods that are higher in highly absorbable phosphorus additives. And this is of note because higher phosphate levels in kidney disease are associated with the progression of kidney disease. So individuals who are um, who have kidney disease and are choosing cheap processed foods um, may see the progression of their disease much faster than individuals who are not choosing these cheap processed foods. However, this information is still preliminary and um, more research will be needed to hammer out the details of this relationship as well. Finally, the relationship between food insecurity and mental health has the most consistent literature base. Um, food insecurity has actually been used to predict depression in both children and adults, and some studies have gone so far as to say that this link is causal for women. They've also found that in mothers, there's this dose-dependent relationship between severity of food insecurity experienced and the number of major depressive episodes experienced or the risk of having a generalized anxiety disorder. So just in summary, um, one, food security is a serious concern in Canada, but especially for those vulnerable subgroups of the population where food insecurity rates are much higher than the general population. Two, there are a whole host of factors that affect food security status geography and income especially, but it's important to remember that even if these barriers don't exist within your population, um, there can still be reasons that an individual or household could be considered food insecure. Number three, there's this hypothesis that food insecurity affects diet, and we know that diet affects chronic disease, and so by the law of syllogism, we suppose that uh, food security affects chronic disease status. And there has been direct evidence between food insecurity and 
several chronic diseases so far. Um, many of these links we're still um, trying to figure out within the academic literature, but there is very good uh, research to show that the, the link between food insecurity and mental health is quite strong. Finally, point five is kind of the so what of it all. And it's just that food insecurity, um, if we can improve food insecurity statuses within Canada, we're improving not only that individual's immediate quality of life, but we're also impacting their long-term health and uh, wellness. So uh, the importance of the relationship between food security and um, long-term health cannot be understated. This is my reference list, um, and at this point I'd just like to thank you very much for your attention.